innovation, disruption, and big issues. This is Business Game Changers with Sarah Westall. 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 Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. Today we're going to have David Williams back, and he's going to be talking about self, the right to self-determination. If you haven't seen the first episode that we had with him, please do that, because I think this will be really confusing if you haven't seen that, because we're gonna, even though he's going to be answering questions that I had and that listeners had based on the first one. And the first ones might be a little confusing just because it's a total paradigm shift. This whole concept that he's talking about is a paradigm shift for most Americans, for most people in the world. And so it's a learning process. But he's going to talk about the concept of two U.S. constitutions because people are talking like there's two U.S. constitutions. He's going to address that. He's also going to address other things in our nation's history, what our Constitution is really about, what it means to have self-determination. And he's going to talk about the Knights of Malta and the Vatican and different things as well. Next episode, he's going to talk about D.C., the City of London, and the Vatican and what those three units mean and how that relates to international law. In this episode, he does talk about the United Nations, what that means, how the United States is involved, who writes the international laws. He addressed that because, I mean, who who does that? And so we talk about that. Especially if we're supposed to follow international law, who's writing those? So let's not waste much more time and let's get right into the interview with David Williams. Hi, David. Welcome back to the program. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Good to be here. Well, we have a lot of questions that we need to go through. And, you know, some of the listeners had questions. I have questions. I figure we could go through some of those questions and then get into some new material that, you know, based on what we did the first time. And for people out there, if you haven't heard the first one, I really recommend that you do that first. And then we go into this. But let's get started. Okay, well, here's, go before, ahead. Before we get started, I want to I say this because I didn't listen to the presentation until like two days ago. So I... Um, I had asked a friend of mine had asked me, he said, how do you think you did the first time around? I said, honestly, I'm not sure how I did the first time around. I felt uncomfortable because when I did my teaching, I don't teach with me on the screen. This is your, your interview with me on screen is the first interview I've done on screen. I've done other radio interviews and things in the past. He said, well, why do you think you did so? Why do you think you wouldn't have felt comfortable doing that? I said, because honestly, I teach like this black ink on white paper. And that's what I did on my website for years. I said, I felt like a prop comic with no props. (laughs) Well, that's okay. You did great. I think everybody feels that way. So nobody probably knows any different. I was really, yeah, when I looked at it, I was really happy with the interview. It was really good. Well, good. And and one of my comments from my people coming back was that you're good. You're a great interviewer. We love your business name or the, the name that you have, Business Game Changers, because that really is what this is all about. Even in the first interview that we did, I talk about this from contract, from business. This is what nation states do. They're doing businesses. Societies do businesses. They're not here to pat you on the head and make sure you got a chicken on your dinner plate at night. That's not their job and when it, it comes to governance. And they probably see it that business is the means for providing for your families and for communities. So it got people focused in that direction pretty heavily. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that law doesn't apply because law is just a system of values and standards that apply to these mechanisms for us doing business. Well, so. let's ask some questions here because these are questions that just with other people talking and there's different things and information out there. A common question theme that arose from the last interview has to do with two constitutions. Many people believe that the United States has two versions. One that was made first and referred to as common law, and the second, or you know, something like that, and the second one that was set up by the United States as a business entity where the citizens have no rights and powers, and that's the one that we really use. Can you explain what these two versions are, if there really are two versions, and what we're really using? Well, first of all, there aren't two versions. We've asked this question for a long time because there were so many people out there talking about it, and they assume that there's some major shift from the Civil War, Civil War times. 
some of those shifts that they think happened was that all the states were states were sovereign and then they were put under subject subjugation to the federal government. That's not true. The states were no longer sovereign entities after the Constitution was drafted in 1789. Well, I take that back. It was ratified or adopted. The um, there is no secondary Constitution. Nobody has ever proven this to us, and it wouldn't make a difference if there was. And the reason this is true is I, you know, I sent you this document. And I said I like to operate with black ink on white paper. So you know, I'd ask you to print this out. But there's a section of the Constitution under the powers of the Congress where it says Congress has the power to make all laws necessary and proper. Now, this was I did a radio interview with Keith Hansen back in 2010, and I brought this issue up about making all laws necessary and proper. See, once you delegate to them, just like a corporation, you delegate their st your stock proxy to the CEO and to the board of directors, they now make all the rules. And what then happens is they determine what becomes necessary and proper. So all Congress has ever had to do was say, well, we did it because it was necessary and proper, and the Constitution gave us the power to do so. This is the original Constitution. And therefore, the question I asked Keith back in 2010, if they can pass all laws necessary and proper, and all they have to do is say it was necessary and proper, then how can they pass a non-constitutional law? So they can do anything they want, essentially. This is what Patrick Henry called the sweeping clause. They can do whatever they want as long as they say it was necessary and proper. And once you hand over your proxy to be a citizen and them to run the government, then they're the ones determining what necessary and proper actually means, not you. You only have a right of suffrage every four years. If you don't like what they did, you can vote them out and get a new crew in there. Now, the first constitution, that one is a corporate type constitution where citizens have no rights. That's just came from day one. From day one. And these were the things that I put in here when I sent you this. I wanted to show you certain irregularities because in the first show you asked me, what is it that people are missing about international law? What is it they're missing about the constitution? And my comment was, is I said 98% of people don't read it. I would actually venture to guess it's more like 99.9% .9 of people in the United States have never read the Constitution. They don't know what it says. And so going into, I'm going to put my glasses on, sorry. Well, that's what uh, happens when one, you get older like us. <laughs> I know. That's what I say. Not old, just older. Yeah, you got to use the word <laughs> older. Yes. And um the, one of the irregularities to me when I first read the Constitution was there's three times in the Constitution where it says that they're holding an office of honor, trust, or profit. Three times the word profit is in here. So if they're not doing business, then why is the word profit in here? This is a business document. And it's all about how they're going to run things, how what the legislative powers are, what the executive powers are, what the judicial powers are. And then how much terms they're going to have, how long they're going to sit in office, and things like what powers they have under Article 1, Section 8, which is the powers of Congress to make post roads, post offices, regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. And the one I like the best is obviously related to international law, to define and punish piracies and felonies on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. Now... One of my props would have been the Law of Nations, but I don't—I couldn't find it. I had to travel because of the flooding in Florida. But I did have in, me, in my car something called Law of Nations Cases, Documents, and Notes. Because people don't understand how much international law applied to what they were doing to begin with. They read the Law of Nations. They understood that that Constitution was drafted exactly in accordance with Law of Nations to the point where, you know, I have document after document now that I have like this, and you can see notes. These are things that I read years ago. This is the Law of Nations as part of national law of the United States. So people have had this lack of understanding of what's there. So going back to your question about is there a secondary constitution, even if there was, they gave themselves the power and authority to do it to begin with. And and as far as you know, you haven't seen any proof for a second constitution that they're actually operating under. Now, we've asked for it for a lot of years. I mean, we did a lot of FOIAs to the government years ago in relationship to our IRS records in relationship to a lot of different things. Just to get all my IRS records, for instance, we did 24 FOIAs to the, to the IRS 
to recover all of our records to find out that everybody in the IRS is operating under alcohol, tobacco, and firearms because there's no implementing regulations for all these other job performances out here except the regulations that are in Code of Federal Regulations 27, which relates to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. So I was still a tobacco farmer. Wow. Okay. All the well, way up to 1990, all the, all the way up to 1999 when I was living in St. Kitts in the Caribbean. That's incredible. Okay. So one thing that you said is that the constitution doesn't represent the average citizen. If that's the case, who does it represent? It represents the people that signed it because it's a compact, just like a corporate charter. People want to say, well, everything is corporate. Well, no, a corporate charter it's still a compact. It's still a contract. It's signed by four people or whoever starts this corporation or corporate entity. and don't have the same positions in it that we see in the federal government. President, and it was, vice it was president, people secretary, and treasurer. But it was people representing themselves, not representing a state or other people? If you read the preamble of the Constitution, it says, we the people of the United States. And the word people is capitalized. It falls under language procedure called a capital M. It really narrows it down to specific people. We do this for ourselves and our posterity. Now, the reasons they were doing it, which is all those commas, it's interesting how they divert attention from one thing and then shift back to another. If you take all the commas out about establishing a more perfect union, which is what they were doing, if you take all that stuff out, is we, the people of the United States, established this constitution for the United States of America. Now, most people don't know, but that's two separate entities in law. United States and United States of America. That's because the original declaration established the United States of America. The Confederation was established as uh, sovereign states coming together as a confederation. But the Congress had no power. They had no power to tell these states what to do once they did the Articles of Confederation. Uh, It was a horrible government. Madison talks about it extensively in his writings about how bad it was. So what happened was they had requisitions of debt that they had to pay. Those debts had to be paid back on the Revolutionary War. And this is something I needed to correct from the first interview. I said that they did comply. The compliance was to draft the Constitution so that the poor, powerful central government could begin to pay those debts that were unpaid. The reality is they still never paid them, not in full. The, the nation is still staying in bankruptcy uh, on an international level, and it's been in bankruptcy ever since. From 1782, when they agreed to pay the debt, to 1789, when they didn't pay the debt, that's the advent of the Constitution, create a more powerful central government, and we're going to make you pay the debt. No, so, it was, so we were we have been formally in bankruptcy on an international level for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, yes. It was one of my points and authorities that I did. Um, Because people want to know, well, why would you form a separate state? Why would you come out? Well, the same reasons that they did it. You know, you get tired of tyranny, and taxation is the biggest tyranny you can find. Well, what does that mean, though? What what does it mean for us to be sitting in bankruptcy for hundreds of years? I mean, if we're sitting there for a certain amount of time, does it stop having meaning? No, it doesn't. it, It continues to have meaning. These are the reasons why you had, in 1859, the Civil War. I love it, Civil War. It was not about slavery. That was an ancillary issue. It was about money. Well, of course. It was about the debt. And the South was trying to secede from the Union and leave those debts with the North. That's what would have happened, and they can't do that. Then you have the New Deal, because when they came in with the Federal Reserve Act in um, 1913, they figured out mathematically that they can bankrupt any nation in 16 years just using Federal Reserve Banking because it's a nine-to-one fraud. And so by 1929, this was how they got the gold. The Yellow Brick Road, the Wizard of Oz, that's, the, that's the, all the gold leaving to go to the Emerald City in London. This is a constant, like you said, almost like a joke on people because somebody's sitting behind the scenes looking at this and they know what's going on and they're putting down a program like that movie The Matrix that I talk about where people are being sold this dream that they've got some sort of rights and freedoms and that their life is all, quote, normal. And they have no clue what's going on behind the scenes, and they simply don't read what it was already put in place that gave the authority to do these things. Well, why, why do, um, or why are citizens bound to the Constitution and to the contract if they weren't party to the signing of it? That is, that 
I saw that question on the, the YouTube channel when, because uh, I watched it on YouTube. That is the best question that came out of everything is the panel for case in 1854, specifically the judge said, it is clear that the constitution is a compact and equally clear you're not a party to it. Now, what he was telling Paddleford in that case was, these, this didn't give you rights. You're, you're trying to claim that they violated inspection taxes in the state of Georgia in violation of the Constitution. And he actually told Paddleford there was another way that they got this, and it was by length of time. They have requisitioned you to pay this, and under municipal law and under acquiescence, you now have to pay this debt. And acquiescence becomes huge in this. Now, the difference is, though, if you look at the law of nations, especially in book number one, section 220 and 212, I'm sorry, 212 would be the place where it is. It says the children naturally follow the conditions of their fathers. Everybody in the United States, because of the 14th Amendment and because of going back before then, they have an oath and allegiance. That is a separate contract from the Constitution. And that oath and allegiance pins you to the United States government, where it says you shall have no other sovereign other than the United States uh, government or the United States of America. Um, you will have no other allegiances to anyone, and it's that allegiance contract that binds you. All allegiance, it's the word liege is right there. They became your liege. So it doesn't matter whether it's a king, a monarchy, a republic, or a democracy. If you have that contract on you, then that's the contract that you have to abide by. And in the 14th Amendment, they just made it really clear that those that are born are naturalized uh, in the United States, meaning into the jurisdiction under that government, shall be subject to the government thereof. They're subjects. That's what the word subject means. Well, when the Supreme Court takes a ruling and they look to see if it, re it matches the Constitution when it comes to, like, the right to bear arms or freedom of the speech, w what does that mean and what rights do we have in, at that point? You know, it seems okay. like we have rights. That's what is is hard for people to get their head around. Yeah, it's the appearance. It is the appearance, but it's the illusion. So now here's the here's another fallacy about the Constitution itself. It says that there were three equal branches of government. The truth of the matter is they are not equal. Uh, John Quincy Adams, and I sent you, in, in this document I sent over to you, this was the last thing I put in here because this is out of Jubilee of the Constitution that, that uh, he was the sixth president. He wrote it back in 1839. And so it's always been acknowledged that the legislative does not have as much power as the executive. If you look at the Constitution itself, they only met one time a year. It says the first Monday of December, they met one time. The president ran everything. And that was he, because he was presiding, president, he was presiding over the bankruptcy. So everything here is, is geared toward paying back that debt. So when the Supreme Court comes along and they say something's not under or something is unconstitutional, well, we already have it that Congress can't pass an unconstitutional law is necessary and proper. It's like watching a show, but literally the federal judges don't have the power and the authority to even enforce it. That comes from the executive branch. Well, so if they come, can't make... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, well, well, they can't come, make the executive branch execute. I mean, it's, it's up to them. It's up to the head executive. Well, how about now, when Trump was trying to, when he was trying to keep the Mexican or the immigrants out and they took him to court and then they stopped his immigration ruling? How, how well, is that happening? How is it happening today? We live in a different world today. And the powers that are behind all of this, they're not going to allow Trump to do what he wants to do. They're controlling the rest of Congress, and everybody else up there knows it. And they're also controlling the judges. We saw this even in courts when we were there because we saw the honor, judges honor international law above everything else. I mean, the grace that we were extended by challenging, and my, and my challenge to the system was not to try to change the system. I just wanted to find the door out. As I told an agent that showed up in 2006, we're sitting at Kinko's, and we have a five-hour conversation. He said, why did you want to take on an 18,000-pound gorilla anyway? I said, I really didn't. I'm just trying to find the door out. And the reason I was trying to find the door out is things like this. This says that the president here, this is Quincy Adams, saying that the president has more than dictatorial powers. But then why? But he, that, can, he has more than dictatorial pro powers, but Trump doesn't They because he, our country has been has taken a, over? He still has to get the executive branches, the military, and everybody to go along with his orders. I, I've seen this president actually coming. I mean, I, I honestly, I, if, 
I told you that I would end up, we, we had, you and I had a long conversation on Friday and it was a really good conversation. Let's do a series and let's get into more things besides. Well, you this. have some like, really fun things that people are going to have fun hearing. Oh, it's all, we've studied so many things. My, my life after 1999, it was almost 18 hours a day. It was business and then study, business and study, no TV, no radio, anything. And through that, we've, you know, one of the, like on my website, one of the rabbit holes that I talk about in the matrix, because I've had 13 rabbit holes in the matrix. One of them was the language rabbit hole because they've used words in language, what I call spelling to cast a spell over people where they think that they words mean what they think they mean. Um, versus what they actually mean in law and in the society and those that are running because they're not asking you, the, the common man, they're not asking his opinion. You know, one of the things you mentioned that's about true. common law. And that's fact because they've done, say, Northwestern and Stanford did a study showing that it doesn't even matter what people want. They go and they decide totally irrelevant to what people are asking for. Well, I'll, let's, you ask a question about that, about common law. Let me get into that for one second because I love bringing this one up. And we'll get into other other topics later, like alchemy and you know the different things, the words, the language, uh, ecclesiastical law. I can tell you right now, ecclesiastical law runs everything. It's the reason why a courtroom is set up the way it is. The judge is wearing robes. You got a cloud of witnesses on one side. There are twelve witnesses that are supposed to be your peers. Now people don't even understand what the word peer means. That comes under peerage. This means you're a common man being judged by lords and ladies under peerage. You're not equal in that courtroom. Because, and because originally it was people who were of higher level in the society that would come and judge you. Yes, exactly. Because this comes out of uh, old British feudal law where you had lords, earls, dukes, esquires, but, but I'm sorry, it, squires or whatever. Is it fair to say that now it's viewed differently because we truly have our peers that end up being huh. part of the jury? That's all the illusion. They're, they, yeah, they, the, under Admiralty, and I was just listening to the informer on Visigoth Radio recently. It was a conversation that he had. It was something after mine, and I remember um, this guy was one of our guys that we we didn't network with him, but he put out a lot of books and he put out a lot of videos and things about the history of the U.S. Some of the stuff that most of everything he said is right. He just never had a solution or a remedy to what to do about this. Which is what um, we're going to start getting into because I think that's what people need. We need to create a foundation, get some cereals and or cereals, get some solutions and remedies right. in place so people understand it and what they can do, and then get into all sorts of cool other stuff. Well, that's the reason I call the website and the DVD series Matrix Solutions because um, when I read the Law of Nations and it talks about murmur and sedition, all of this whining, griping, and complaining and protesting, it accomplishes absolutely nothing. It's not a part of any parliamentary procedure. It doesn't affect any of these Congress people. And I'm real clear when it comes about this. I don't. I will debate anybody on these issues. I've done this for years. As soon as I read what Alexander Haig said about all this when they did the Million Man March in D.C., you know, he was a secretary under Reagan administration. And the media asked him, what do you think about all this? What's the government's position on the on the march? His comment was, well, let them march and protest. We don't care as long as they keep paying their taxes. <laughs> well, that's, so, that's so, not you know, funny, actually. It, but. It, well, it, well, it is in a way, but it's not. I mean, it's, 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 it's horrendous. And, you know, I tell people this. If you don't want out, that's fine. But I was looking for a remedy. What is the door? I told an agent that. And, uh, and they knew that I did. They knew I meant it. They knew that I would find a way to do this peacefully. Uh, you know, we filed against the IRS. Twenty one of us did in the Supreme Court back in 2004. And they never answered. But we changed our name. We set up a separate entity called Unity States of our world, filed a treaty with Bern, Switzerland, with the Universal Postal Union, came in under Admiralty, came in under Postal. And the reality of it was what we were looking to do was what the founders did. We stated a tort claim, but the reason for the tort was not to get money. It was to find the reasons why. Why would you separate yourself? Why would you break the political bands? You know, and I look at it today. We're under such a burdensome tax system. I would say we. I came out of it so that I could deal with it by immunity and variation by agreement. I can tell you today that my bank accounts are all W-8 foreign exempt. Well, I've got I want to get, I wanna get into that. Degree. I want to get into but, what rights you still have and what you've gained. But before we get into that, I, I still want okay. you to answer the question 
about when the Supreme Court deals with whether things meet the Constitution or not, and when they're talking about right to bear arms, freedom of speech, that, you know, like, for example, freedom of speech, there's been landmark cases on freedom of speech, and that really does impact the citizen and what they're allowed to do. So how does, how does that work if we don't have rights? Um, it, I, I, it falls under what I call privileges or granted rights, like, for instance, the, all those amendments themselves, or they say they're amendments to the Constitution, but the Bill of Rights itself was not an amendment to the Constitution. The Constitution stands by itself, and the Bill of Rights stands by itself. So is it I almost like an employee handbook? Yes, exactly. And if you go into the code today, United States Code, under Title V, 552A, subsection B, Anybody who is entitled to any federal assistance or federal program is called federal personnel. So every U.S. citizen is federal personnel. Okay, so you quit quit as being a citizen. Okay, when you quit as a citizen of the United States, what rights did you gain and what ones do you still have? I mean, do you still have the same rights as everybody else in this country or did you lose some and what ones did you gain? Uh, I didn't lose anything because I looked at them as privileges. Um, a part of the document here that I sent to you, if you read case law where they can they can charge an innocent person for a crime that never occurred, and now the, I mean, the prosecutor can knowingly, I'm like, what rights do I have if I can knowingly be charged for a crime that never occurred? That happens all the time. And I can be, it happens all the time. I've got friends of mine. I got one friend of mine who spent three years in prison for just that they, he was a millionaire and somebody in the county down there in Atlanta or that area make it. They just wanted his properties. They put him in prison and basically they just held him there until he pled guilty. Then they sold all of his properties at the courthouse step. And to one guy, one guy bought 185 properties at 30 you know, cents do, on the dollar. If you do too much of so, that though, people are going to rise up and there's going to be, there's going to be the civil streets. war. Yeah. Yeah. There's, gonna... yeah. And, and guess what happens after that? This is some, something that I really am glad you brought up because I went back into this thing about whining, griping and complaining. The problem is, is that everybody is has like this word here, Black's Law Dictionary. This word right here is almost like people have an allergy when it comes to this word. They start heaving. It, it goes in the back of their mind. It makes their eyes roll in the back of their head. Why? This is where th I don't know what it was. What does it mean that bothers people so much? Because they think the law is unjust. And what is the problem with this is most people, if you ever well, it is on the case down, of your not to interrupt here, but. In the case of your um, friend who lost all his, you know, was prosecuted for a crime he didn't commit and then lost everything he had, that's a definition of unjust. It is unjust, but it is common law in this country because common law is built on judge, judicial decision in any jurisdiction. It's not based on England. The United States is not. They have their own constitution. England has its constitution. Um, my point about this is most people are really not upset about the law in general. They're really upset about abuse of power. And this has to do with human nature. I told you all along when we first started talking, the problem is human nature. You well, give somebody power. Well, well what does the law say war. that's not, that makes it impartial, that it could be, it, you know, uh, why are you saying that people aren't mad about the law when the law allowed that to happen? Well, allowing it to happen, what does that mean? Who's allowing why it? Is somebody that legal? Why is it legal to prosecute somebody for a cr crime they haven't committed? Because that's the United States co uh, common law. Now, that this is my reason for saying, it's like if you let's look at North Korea. Who would want to live in North Korea, right? Um, well, because well, of the abuse of North power. Korea. That's a clear yeah, abuse of power. Abuse of power, and the same thing with China. It's like people want to say, "Well, I have constitutional rights." Well, do they extend to China when you travel to China? The answer is no, and that is the difference in answering your question about what happened with me. My immunities and, and things, they extend into other countries. The United States has recognized me. They've written to me on five different occasions as ambassador. Uh, oh, got to go for a prop. Um, it's like I said in the beginning, I felt like a prop comment without the props. Um, this is recognition from the nation state of Haiti as me as prime minister. This is from uh, Liberia as me as prime minister. And that's because I took everything over in 2012 because the other people weren't getting anything done. And it was recognized that I had more experience and more, especially in the courtrooms and getting recognition from the United States. And so today I live by variation by agreement and with immunity so that the liability for all this other stuff that's going on with the U.S. doesn't stick to me. 
if I go to another country, I have the same immunity, immunity extended to me under international law. Now, a lot of that can be found as in any other in ambassador, any other ambassador. It doesn't matter. My properties are inviolable. I have foreign exempt accounts with the banks here. So you can um, commit murder and you're still fine. I mean, I'm not no. laughing because it's funny, but. Well, actually, that goes on. You know, I have to give an example. When under the Obama administration, there was a CIA operative. He was found out to be a CIA operative that they had appointed as a consular agent in Pakistan. He murdered two people and. Obama demanded his release immediately, but once Pakistan found out what was really going on, and this was a street fight, and basically a shootout, and I don't know who it occurred, but who, I don't know who got shot, they refused to let him go. Then the court shifted over there to have the judgment made under Sharia law, which means the family could be paid restitution for the deaths, and I'm assuming that he was then after released. I don't know what it cost the United States as the quid pro quo for that. But this goes back to this conversation even now that I'm having is that people don't know what's going on in the world. They haven't read these documents. They don't know anything about them. They're running around complaining. And if they go to civil war over this, I got news for them. If they don't come back and learn, just learning how to pick up guns and weapons and pitchforks and swords does not mean you learn how to self-govern. If you don't learn this, you'll end up back under the same people you were trying to get out from under. Now, people who study international law, do they know this either? Or is that, are they still fairly clueless? Most people are still fairly clueless because they're, I have said this repeatedly, like some of the books I have, you know, I have pulled that one up a minute ago. Here's a textbook on foreign relations law in the U.S. There's tons of them. A lot of these are written by federal judges, former federal judges. Some of them are written, like Cambridge Universities are written by Shaw. I think he was a former a war court judge, and I could be mistaken on it. That doesn't really matter. I've said for a long time, even to the, all the people around me, the people who have come on board with us, we're moving forward to get these recognitions. We're working on projects in Philippines right now. Uh, we're working on, a, uh, I just met with somebody from Ghana. Uh, they're going to be introducing us to the Ministry of Education because they're interested in what we provide as far as education services. Um, but I've said it for a long time. How is it that these guys write about self-determination? They write about international law but they don't do it themselves. I don't personally understand that. Why, like a former World Court judge, he's a British citizen. You can't tell me he agrees with everything going on in Britain. Is it because he feels protected in general and he doesn't, as a citizen, like people being employees in a company, it's just easier than running your own company? Yes, that's a, that, that is a great analogy. There's a lot of business game changers. I've said this for a long time. People that have an employee mindset will never do what I've done, because if you're if you if you can't accept the risk of certain things, then you're not going to reap the rewards that come on the other side of it. And the founders of the USA knew that they were sick and tired of it. And look, let's look what they they revolted over like three percent T tax. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, look where we're at today, now. That's just if, if they were alive so, today, they'd be running around slapping everyone in the face, going, "What here. are you people doing?" Well, okay, so let's talk about the founders of the country. They saw major flaws with their original constitution, and and in the document you sent me, there was a lot of things that they're talking about. Can you give us some of the flaws that they were talking about, and well, are they still built into the constitution today? Well, they're not flaws of the constitution. The constitution was to rectify the flaws of the. Articles of Confederation. Okay, so what are the flaws of that, and and what was fixed? Well, the flaws were was that the Congress had no power; they had no, they could not make the states pay the requisitions um, for the debt because the basically in Article Four of the Treaty of Paris, which was the peace treaty between the United States of America and the King, the King said, "I will treat with you as sovereign, independent states." Interestingly. Interestingly, they say everybody says it was 13 colonies that became 13 states. Only 12 of them were actually mentioned in the treaty. Why is that? I don't know. Can't figure that one out. Delaware is not Bob there. Garrett. It's interesting. I'm like, well, I don't understand why that's not there. But anyway, I, I, I look at some of these things and it's like how things run at the top and every, what people think it, it, below all that. They just believe what they're told. I mean, I was no different. I, I Honestly, I thought that I had constitutional rights I, and, and until I learned that I didn't. You know, I'm standing there going, wait a minute, this is all wrong. And I'm looking well, at my like ex -wife. You, you're not you're not on a foundation anymore. If you don't have that, it's like, well, okay. Yeah, well, I'm just was, kind of it, floating around. It was ripped right out from under me because in 99, we moved to St. Kitts. And we ended up having the two years later to move back because of all these legal issues. 
And I'm often reminded of the movie that they did, Keanu Reeves, The Day the Earth Stood Still, when the professor says, so only at the precipice does mankind change. I was pushed to a precipice where I had no choice. And after that, I went straight into the federal courts and I started challenging the system. I literally got so high up on their radar, I couldn't get off. And I finally told Sherry in 2004, I said, if I don't get immunity, I'm going to end up in jail like everybody else. But ba ba was, basically, you did what the founders did for themselves. Yes. You I wasn't alone. I, we had an, go ahead. We had an entire, we, I wasn't alone. We had an entire network. I mean, the amount of volumes of people that were studying and learning and look what I found here and look what I found there and all of us come together. Um, now, what's interesting about all that, I mentioned that we, we did file a case in 2004 where 21 of us filed it against the IRS and the Supreme Court. Only two of us out of that are left today because although the principles that I believe that I teach and I read in all of this material, I believe the principles are easy. Oh, I'm sorry. I should say that I believe the principles are simple. I just don't think it's easy. It's never been easy. So what happened any, to the other 22? Oh, well, I don't know. They went off and went back in. And they did what my ex-wife did. They tried. She, in 2006, tried to get me to do an offer and compromise with the IRS. And I shared, shared uh, they'll shoot me in the back now. After everything I've done, if I tuck tail and run now, they'll just, they'll just eliminate me. So they made yeah. compromises with the U.S. government, got settled back in. Are they all okay? Yeah, by, as far as I know. I mean, I haven't kept in touch with, with many of them. But the compromise, I mean, is like IRS will do offer and compromise. A lot of people get so into this So have you not paid your taxes forever? <laughs> I don't owe any taxes. Okay, because you're your self-determination. So I, well, let's put it this way. I'm, I stay here under what's called right of embassy. That's in the Law of Nations. It's in Book 4, uh, Sections 50, 55, those areas where it talks about the right of embassy. Because look how, many, look how many dignitaries and how many foreigners live in the United States just in D.C. And they all have these immunities and stuff. Now, there's some saber rattling going on right now with the U.S. and Russia. And I just think it's all for show. But, um, but still, those people have those immunities while they're here. Can you work uh, for a corporation and not pay taxes if you are have your classification? You can, but the bottom line of it is the owners of corporations wouldn't understand this either, so they wouldn't take they wouldn't quote take the risk. That's the reason why I've always I've been in business for myself since I was twenty six. Uh, you could and do just, it. You could do it as an entrepreneur or a business owner. You couldn't do it as an employee. Yes, that's why I've, I've always said business game. You like your website, business game changers. I have told people this is how you do business at an international level so that you have immunity so that when you de deal with other nations and other countries who are just there to do business as well, you're going to them on an equal footing where you have immunities when you hit the ground. That That is huge. You yes, come it's up, huge. And that, that allows you to do charity work in a lot of countries like Haiti and other places where the political climate is mm. is terrible. Yeah, we actually own some land in Haiti. We're looking at doing some things down there. One of our contacts from Haiti uh, is a pastor. He supports 12 orphanages down there, and he's got a hospital he wants us to take over. And through one of my partners in Jacksonville, we believe that we can work with Doctors Without Borders, and that we will actually go. We, we established an education NGO. It started in Liberia. What we can actually do is go to the colleges in Florida and set up an internship program where they will go down to Trady, I'm sorry, they will go down to Haiti, and they will train uh, as part of their curriculum and get course credit for it. And we haven't set this up yet. It's been in the works for quite a while, but we already know we can do it. It's just a matter of time. So can somebody um, like Izili Danto, who's just amazing, she's doing everything. Her whole passion in life is to help Haiti and the children of Haiti and the people of Haiti. I don't know anybody who is more committed. Her whole life is this. If she did what you did, self-determination, everything would almost clear up for her and being able to get things accomplished. Yes, yeah, she would have to come on board with us, and then we would we would make the inroads back into Haiti, uh, because you know there, there's there's a Haiti's just a weird a, a weird animal. I mean, their president only gets to sit for five years and one term, and it's almost like they're there to get what they can while they're there, and then they move it's on. It's terrible, and they're and, connected and nothing, to the United States. The politics is terrible. Yeah, but you and and or the UN. Don't know it, but 
the money people control Haiti. Haiti, even with the even with the money that everybody thought went to Haiti, none of it ever went to Haiti. It went to the foundations, the NGOs, yes. the Clinton Foundation. No, no money ever got to. And Haiti. that's what that's what Ezeli Danto, the shows I did with her. She was like nothing. Yeah. Even with the Red Cross, Red Cross got five hundred million dollars, and they built six crappy homes that you can't yeah. even really say are homes. Yeah, yeah, I know. They built six houses. That was it. So going back to what we're talking about here, this is a way of doing business. I wanted to be able to do business with immunity. I, whether it was in the U.S. or not was irrelevant to me because I didn't want to be subjected to all of this nonsense. I didn't want to be subjected to case law where they could charge an innocent person for a crime that never occurred. And, you know, I didn't know it was going to, you know, uh, the divorce that happened was basically over the fact that, you know, she just got upset every time I turn around. You're starting some kind of federal problem or you make a federal <laughs> issue out of it. If you have and, to be with somebody who has uh, an open brain. I mean, you really do. Oh, Otherwise, it would it, really freak her out. Well, she was. And, it, and she was on board. She was even on board with what we did at the, well, that, in, yeah. at the Supreme Court. What really ended it was the agent showing up and threatening me. But see, I look at all of this, too, as a test. It was a test. You know, I grew up on a farm in North Carolina. If you were the powers that beat or running the United States for 240 years, I just look at it like this. They said, go, go find out what that guy's made out of. Is he really as tough as he thinks he is? And so I don't I, I don't take it personally. It's not but personal But doesn't the to me. Constitution say that you can quit as a citizen? That's that's a law of nations. And, but also, and that's one of the things I didn't print out for you. I'm glad you brought it up. If you read the U.S. Expatriation Act in 1868, it says that any officer or official that inhibits anybody from expatriating is against U.S. policy. So they were, the crime. way they treated you was against U.S. policy. No, no, no. They, they, they finally acknowledged it. It's just that. Okay. I think, but initially, I think, they were. Um, well, they didn't. By threatening you and things. They can't, they can't do that. That only happened in 2000. That only happened in 2006. And it wasn't, it was a threat. And believe me, it was real. But at the time, here's the here's the honest uh, honest part of this, is that I still had a U.S. passport and I still had U.S. identification and I hadn't done anything as far as a renunciation or a naturalization process into a foreign jurisdiction. So although I t accepted the ambassador appointment, it still looked like I was from a paperwork contract standpoint. It looked like I was sitting the fence. Well, that got me off the fence. Okay, now you're and a pretty much it was. The, well, it was pretty much, you make this choice. If you land over here, you land over here. You make the choice which side of the fence you're going to land on. And I knew if I landed back on being a U.S. citizen, forget it, I'm going to prison. Okay, so now being... Because to answer your question, I hadn't paid IRS taxes in a decade before that before that had occurred. Okay, so now that you're, you know, you're the prime minister of your own country... What does that allow you to do from a charity standpoint? Because I know most of the work that you do is charity to help other people. What has it, you know, taken off your the shackles so that you can make a difference? Um, well, we've been able to do, like I sent a container made uh, directly from us to Liberia. That was in 2015, and this was for medical supplies for the Ebola outbreak and stuff. That's where I got the letter back from their Ministry of Health as prime minister, thanking us for all of the contributions. Even on that container, we sent 25 computers because we were working on setting up an education NGO at the time. We stationed that in Liberia because we have boots on the ground there. We have a gentleman who's our vice president of the NGO. That NGO is a non-governmental entity uh, organization and it's called International Education Professionals Association. And the first thing we did was went into Morovia and set up a computer lab so that he can run it. And now we're showing these people how we can help them institute higher education because a lot of these countries, they really need it. I mean, they're, they're actually begging for education more than they're begging for aid. They want the education. They're tired. They want their people educated now. And it's not that they don't have Well, some, because they understand just, that education is the foundation for getting them out of the situation they're in. Yes. Well, it's the same way here. It's the exactly. same way it was with me. I had to be more educated on constitutional law, national law, international law. And even in this book here, I can tell you, if people don't believe it, just go read case law. This one here, it, um, this book cost me three bucks. I just found it as a used book on Abe's books. Um, the Law of Nations, Cases, Documents, and Notes. And these are all U.S. cases throughout this book. 
And the most famous one that people would recognize in here is the uh, U.S. Ver um, the Habana case, where the judge said international law has always been a part of our law. Well, it's black ink on white paper. Who, writes Who wants to argue with it? Who writes the international law and makes sure that that is good and that those laws are, you know, who has the right mm -hmm. to change those and write those and put those in place? If you want to get technical, I've said for a long time that over the past 250 years, it's Britain and the U.S. have been writing the most of international law. If you look at the U.N. today, they are part of the Security Council. And by the way, for those that think you're going to get the U.S. out of the U.N., the Security Council agreement says that the United States is a permanent member of the Security Council. I know you may have a raw problem with the word permanent, but it does actually mean permanent. They're not going anywhere. The U.S., for all intents and purposes, is the U.N. When the military has to go to on an international thing that the Security Council wants to do, they call the U.S. military and then they send them. Is and there any checks and balances to wait a minute, international did I answer the law? Question? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I cut checks you off? No, no, no. Who writes it? Okay, these are agreements among nation states, and it's, it started with the law of nations, to answer your question. But today, with the implementation of the U.N., and in 1947, the U.N., all the nations agreed, they came together, and they did a resolution to form what's called the International Law Commission. And the reason is, is because they're doing away with customary international law and replacing it with codified international law. So that now, like what I said earlier, they actually have a signature. They have black ink on white paper because over time there's been way too many arguments over what's customary. So to answer your question today, it's done by the General Assembly under the auspices of the Security Council because the Security Council holds veto power over the General Assembly. And when they implement a new law, we automatically have to follow it at the country level. Yes. Absolutely, because the treaties bind a nation. I mean, it's one of the things that was in that Paddleford case when he was talking about acquiescence. It said in municipal law, it's, it's, it, we have acquiescence, but it also applies to the law of nations that acquiescence in breach of a treaty binds an entire nation. So this was one of the arguments, too, from the founders, was that the treaty power would undo any state rules, regulations, or whatever, and it has. You know, a lot of people think the United Nations is a um, not a good organization. There's a lot of bad things that go yeah. on there. In your experience, have you seen a lot of bad apples? Well, the bad apples are everywhere. I mean, you, I mean, you look at here in the U.S. I mean, I, I lived in St. Kitts for two years, and they always complain about the corruption in their government. They were taking foreign aid from China. They were taking foreign aid from the U.S. They buy their kids Beamers and they do whatever in the governments and all that kind of stuff. And I told them, I said, look, it's just as corrupt everywhere else. It's just as corrupt in the U.S. They're just better at hiding it. Here, they're just blatantly in your face. Um, you know, because you just mentioned it a while ago about Haiti. How do all these organizations and these foundations get all this fun money and that money's supposed to go to Haiti and then none of it ends there? Well, I just hope that, you know, so, US, yes, citizens, U.S. citizens get smarter and they give it to smaller organizations like yours or mm -hmm. Ezeli's that actually go and get something done and stop giving it to the Red Cross or somebody who, mm -hmm. if they don't accomplish something, just like in business, if you get $500 million and you build six houses and you completely fail, then you need mm -hmm. to suffer the consequences of being so incompetent at what you claim you're good at and give it to the small organizations that are actually helping people. Well, until people stop, it, until they stop becoming, I've said it so many times, ignorance is the most dangerous thing on this planet. And you can't pretend that just sending money somewhere, it, you, people, people do things to feel good about themselves. I mean, okay, fine, it's an altruistic thing and I feel good that I did this for Liberia. But I had a self-interest motive as well. That was to get the recognition for doing it. I wanted that letter back in my book that says, yes, that guy's the prime minister. Why? Well, the biggest maxim under law is res ipsa loquitur. It means the thing speaks for itself. It cannot be denied. I have the recognition. You know, one of the comments that came up about on your uh, uh, YouTube channel was about, look what happened to Dom in 1998. Well, I wasn't even involved in 1998. Why do I care what a bunch of dead people did in 1998? What was asked of me in 2012 was to take the broken bicycle chain and put a new chain on it. 
and keep on peddling? Why would I throw away recognition from Nigeria? Why would I throw away recognition from uh, Congo, this South Africa? This is the country Africa? that you are prime minister of, you're saying? Yes. Why okay. would I throw That's all why of if that? They, if they search under Wikipedia for the your country, that they'll learn all this stuff, and you took it over and cleaned it up. Yes, and you can find it under the, there's two different Wikia sites. One is regular Wikipedia, one is the Wikia.micronations, and if you go read the one under Micronations, you'll read the true history of the Dom. If you come over here and read the one that's up on Wikipedia, because trust me, they have their own agendas too. We've tried to get things changed. We found out that there are 55 writers that monitor what we try to change on the Wikipedia website. And they say, well, it's not third party information. And we're coming back going, but what you have up there is not third party information. No one in the Dom has ever been prosecuted for anything. The only thing that ever got happened was dual citizens got prosecuted as US citizens. And that only happened twice. And it wasn't for any crime that's put out there. All that stuff is hearsay. Every single bit of it is hearsay. We can't get it changed because of the propaganda wheel. Yeah, well, that is, that's common for a lot of people. Okay, so I have a couple anyway. questions more on uh, what people are asking you to do. You've been recently contacted by the U.S. government to set up some stuff in Bermuda like you've already done, and also the Knights of Malta, right? Um, well, actually not the U.S. government. But it was We were contacted by the Knights of Malta, and it was right before they got into their big squabble with the, with the Vatican. Um, I was impressed just from getting a phone call. I, mean, I was like, wow, we must be doing something right to get a phone call like this because I'm not here to judge the Vatican. I'm not here to judge the U.S. and what goes on. I wasn't trying to change the U.S., only my relationship to it. If people want to be a, a citizen of that, it is a highly individual choice, the things that I have done. They are highly individual choices. So, um, But what does the Knights of Malta they, they, want from you? Well, they, they offered to help do some humanitarian aid, but the bigger thing was to set up a human rights organization and to start conversations on landless sovereignties. Because let's admit it, as soon as they all put satellites in there, there's no unclaimed land on this planet. You just can't go squat somewhere else. But this is also understanding that you, it is under, it's about understanding universal jurisdiction, international law, concurrent jurisdiction, and all the things that go along with that. And... That's why I said that just picking up bullet uh, weapons and firing bullets or whatever, if people don't learn how to self-govern, they're going to end up back under the same people they're complaining about now. So what was the squabble between the Knights of Malta and the Vatican? It seemed kind of nebulous to me, but it really had to do with um, – there's something that I haven't talked about in relationship to this, even with the states and the U.S. There's there's a word in international law or in a feudal law, it comes out of feudal law, it's called suzerainty. It actually means where there's a hierarchy of lords or a hierarchy of kings. <clears throat> if you go back into the Book of Doom, you go back, uh, you can look up the Secret Treaty of Verona or whatever. Um, and if you look at, I did a presentation, you can find this one up online, it's the truth about the Magna Carta. The first part of this is done by a guy named Walter Veith, the 22 minutes of it, he talks about the battle over Britain and what happened in 12, 13 AD. The crown of Great Britain was laid before the Pope. So there's a hierarchy that runs from the Pope to Britain to the U.S., um, the, the Pope to his Britannic Majesty, his cat, most cat, Christian Majesty, which was the King of France, his most Catholic Majesty, King of Spain, his most faithful Majesty, King of Holland. All or the King of the Netherlands, I'm sorry. And all of this has been going on for thousands of, or hundreds of years, and people just don't know the hierarchy behind the scene. And until those contracts are unraveled, which they're not, then they still apply. It's no different than the debt of the United States not being paid from the Revolutionary War. Well, they changed it, the system with the Federal Reserve Act so that now that debt cannot even be paid because you can't create money in the United States without giving them a bond to create more debt money. Yeah, now it's well, a mess. Now it's, they just made it even more of a mess. Okay, so anyway. we are running out of time. So I want to have you back. This is great. We're going to have you back to what talk we, more. Can we break we down here? Can we break down the Vatican, uh, Washington, D.C., the city of London, and how all that relates to the rest of the world the next time we talk? Yes, we could do that. I think That's people um, will be very interested in that. And then, well, go I recommend going to look up the presentation I did on the Magna Carta because, like I said, it won't be me. It's Walter Vive for the first 22 minutes, and then I start making comments about it because there's people that want to talk about common law and how it still applies to them. They'll say, well, even the Magna Carta still applies. 
I have news for him. The Magna Carta does not apply to anything. The king disavowed it after it got done because they, they held a, throat, a sword to his throat to get him to sign it to begin with. And as soon as he got it signed, and then they all left, well, he got his military to go kill all them nobles, and they re, it was all over with. There again, if people don't learn their history, if they don't start learning their history, they're just going to be duped forever. Well, sometimes so, yes, ignorance we can is talk bliss, about though, if you're really ignorant. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you me, so much. Same. I know, you can't stand that. Either can I, obviously. Okay, well, thank you so much, and I'm excited okay. to have you back next time. And any more questions, let's make sure we get all the questions answered. I'll tell you this. I have already been doing some recording that we would be putting up on my YouTube channel, or maybe we'll make a link to it on your YouTube channel or something so that people can go get. I want to respond to people's issues and questions or whatever because I don't leave anything unchallenged. Nobody's going to come to me unless they've got a better solution than my solution. I tell people all the time, hey, you got a better solution than me? Let me know because I'll follow you. So if they think you're I'm wrong, not stupid. if they think you're wrong, challenge you and you will you will address it. You have no problem. Sure. Keep it up. It needs to be transparent. If you're not, what? if you can't be transparent, it, what, what was it? Yeah. The, 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 you can't be afraid to debate something because if you're right through a debate, it'll come out. Here's the other thing about debate, and I've told people this forever. You cannot beat me in a debate. All you can do is improve my knowledge because debate is not meant to be won. It is meant to improve knowledge. Excellent. I love that. That's exactly how people need to think about it. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I got to quote that. I'm going to rewind it and do it slow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, good. You have a great day. All right, Sarah. Thank you. You too.